and the Germans and the Ukrainians go berserk. They run amok through the ghetto and select close to a thousand people on the trucks down the main street to this municipal slaughterhouse and right in front there shoot them. This was axiom number six. By then we knew it's you know, we knew about Stalingrad, we heard about Stalingrad. We we uh, we got uh, word of the liquidation of Warsaw, not yet the uprising, just the liquidation. Uh, didn't hear the word uh, Tremblinka at all, heard Majdanek. And um, middle of 1943, again August, beginning with Action Number Seven, we are told we are liquidating the ghetto. So now, not only do you do you have a death warrant, now you know you have the execution order over your head. What what do they do? So they start running to the forest, digging holes in the ground. Not very good about it, you know. By now, they're just tired. They're just exhausted. So they, every day, every week, there is some more that are dug out and come back. And they're all being assembled in an old movie theater. What did you do at that time? Well, I was still on my job. So you still felt somewhat safe? Well, with the R, I felt safe. This is my passport to life, right? Besides, what else can I do? Uh, I already was in love by then. And I felt that in addition to myself, I now have some more commitment in the area. Because the moment that things started, the liquidation of the camp, Natalia disappeared. Maybe mention who she is and what the situation was. Okay, I I met Natalia in 1942. It started out by me sitting in the office of Johann Glenn Enterprises, making out a weekly report of activities for that period. <coughs> when a, a beautiful young woman entered the office and asked if she could use the telephone. And I was so taken aback by the sight, you know, the beautifully done blonde hair and a clean, nice dress and a um, high heels and oh, you know, well-groomed. Right in the middle I just of the war. Right in the middle of the war. I just, you know, we don't, didn't see sight like that. So I was just staring. Then when she started talking on the phone, I, my eyes caught her eyes, and I saw the, the tragedy in the eyes, and I said to myself, this is not the shiksa, this is a Jewish girl, and she is in trouble. So, but what else, what can I do? She left, and uh, not long later, three or four months later, I met her in the ghetto. She was there with, uh, living with other people, two sisters who knew me, 
who were friends of a cousin of mine that uh, decided to introduce me to her because they thought that maybe I can give her some <laughs> uplifting or something. She was, you know, desperate. And, you know, uh, one thing led to another and, and we fell in love. So by mid-1943, I felt dedicated to her just as much as I am dedicated to myself. And uh, when she disappeared, I didn't know what to do. I was desperate, frantic. And a couple of days later, a man approached me in the ghetto and gave me a letter from her. And he said, if I wanted to see her, I should be at such and such a place after dark, and he'll take me there, which I did. And she was, this was Vladik Grzegorczyk, and uh, she was in the attic of his house uh, with her father and her brother and four other people. So, um, the liquidation of the ghetto continues with a number of aktionen. Every time they would get together five, six hundred people, they would transport them out. Meanwhile, they would use the old movie theater as a assembly place. <clears throat> and they would hold these uh, four or five hundred people in there three, four weeks at a time until the transportation was made available for, for them to be taken away. And there were some horror scenes there because who they were now dealing with are the remnants of the ghetto those who were able to survive the previous five Aksyonen or six Aksyonen, those who already were hidden before and were uncovered, those who were hidden in the woods and couldn't last and came back. You know, they're now dealing with a desperate bunch, the remnants. Every afternoon, the Jewish police would bring in a kettle of soup and some bread and distribute it to the people for the next day. Also clean out the, the uh, uh, sanitary things. There are some horror scenes there. I was only there once, you know, just helping with the, with the logistics. And, you know, what, what they describe as a Gehenna or, 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 or Dante's Inferno, that's what you see there. Like what? Wild eyes, unkept. Uh, dirty, scratching for food, fighting each other, you know, just incredible. Old people, young people, children. And every day they, they bring more. They, all, they find more. So that lasted until there was no one left in the ghetto to take. November 1943. The ghetto is closed. There's uh, 
just the camp left. And the camp now has about 1,500 plus people, all selected for their capability to work or ability to work uh, as uh, oil industry experts or, or, or good service people and all, or people like me, just laborers. <clears throat> I think that was kind of like the last chapter of the Jewish community, if there was any before. What was the life in the camp now just became work-oriented, uh, driven by fear, driven by insecurity of what's going to happen next. We knew it couldn't, it couldn't last forever because as the uh, time went on, uh, the Russians have recaptured Kiev and they were approaching the previous um, uh, Polish border. They were getting close to Stanislavov. We, we knew that the Germans are retreating. And it's well, before come we go on from there, could you describe what the camp situation itself looked like? Was it a former formal camp with barbed wire and towers, or what? What did it look like? Okay, uh, the camp was a um, an old barracks, as I mentioned. Was about a, a three-story building with um, a large courtyard in the middle, sort of uh, almost a square with a courtyard in the middle and a, a water pump in the middle and stables on one side. And because of the way it was built. Uh, it was just one entrance, okay, and it was very easy to surround it with a fence, which they did. And then at the upper level, they formed a, a bridge that was used for the the watchmen the Ukrainian patrol to uh, to watch over the guards. <clears throat> I think as as camps go, you know, it 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 wasn't like what you see uh, in Auschwitz or in Treblinka. In Treblinka was even worse. There was no camp there. It was just extermination. But from the uh, housing ability for 300 cavalrymen and the Polish cavalry, it turned into a barrack for 1,500 uh, workers in the oil field, which uh, you know made it very crowded. It had bunks in each in each each uh, room depending on the size of the room, was either eight or ten or twelve bunks. Uh, there was a central uh, central latrine. There was a, a kitchen down below where you, know, where you lined up for soup. And the routine was pretty much get up in the morning, 5 o'clock, 5.30, because you have a roll call at 6. You get some dark fluid presented as coffee and a piece of bread, and you join your team and you form a marching column and you go to work. That is, if you work uh, north of the city or east or west of the city. 
If you work south of the city, you just go directly to work on your own. The people that ran the place, how, what was their attitude towards the workers? You mean the guards? Yeah, yeah. Were, were these like soldiers or were they civilians? Ukrainian police. Okay. Ukrainian police. <clears throat> and there was a German commandant and there was the Jewish police. And the people in the kitchen were selected for that. And that's it. So, uh, if you if you work north of the city, they didn't want us to go through the city single file or one at a time in any direction that we wanted to. They wanted the column to go through the city and then disperse and go to their places of work. So that would happen like between 6.30 and 7 every morning. March down. It was uh, about a uh, six six mile march across from the camp across the city. So it took about forty five minutes to, to to go across. Anyway, <clears throat> then at the end of the day, when you finish your work, because you were in different parts of the, of the area, and because you may have been on different work shifts, some shifts started at 8 and went to 5, some started at 7, went to 3, some started at noon, both 8 and you know, the oil industry just keeps going 24 hours a day. So depending on what your hours were, you would go back either in smaller groups or by yourself. And that was not unusual to see a Jew with a white armband going through the town at six o'clock in the evening, you know, going going back to the camp. So the camp was viewed by them as a as a uh, as a uh, dormitory, if you will. So it sounds like you had a fair amount of freedom compared to compared with with the with, with the rigorous labor camps or extermination camps. We had a great deal of freedom, and I think this was the saving grace that allowed us, as many of us, to survive. Because. Um, some of the neighboring cities, Drohobic, Sambor, Stray, were liquidated a year before then and declared Judenrein, which means if a Jew is found on a street or any place else, he's subject to immediate execution. No questions asked. <clears throat> So the routine was to uh, do this uh, day after day, if you could, and wait and hope for a better future as the front was getting closer. Now, um, when the front got to uh, Tarnopol, which was about mid-February of 1944. That was my signal not to go back to the camp.